Hey everyone, and welcome back to Country Music Made Me. Thank you so much for joining us once again. If you haven't already, please be sure to check out our website, countrymusicmademe.com. There you can listen to all of our episodes and also sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive content and also stay up to date on all of our upcoming guests. Just head over to countrymusicmademe.com and hit that subscribe button. You can also find us on any streaming platform. So if streaming is your thing, just head over to your favorite, search Country Music Made Me, and give us a follow there as well. On today's episode, we are excited to welcome singer-songwriter Eric Pasley. Now, he is known as a writer for writing hits for others, like Jake Owen's Barefoot Blue Jean Night and the Eli Young Band's Even If It Breaks Your Heart, but he is also known for his hits as an artist, like his number one single, Friday Night. He recently released his new record filled with reimagined hits from throughout his career. It's been an amazing journey and we had a great time talking about all the success and how he's gotten to this point in his career. So please enjoy our conversation with Eric Pasley. I want to start out back when you were a youngster and ask the memories that come back when I ask about the Boss American drum set. The Boss American drum set. You saw the video. Hey, you've seen the pictures. That was in Waco, Texas, on Bintry Circle. And uh, the, my first memories were in that house. I was born in Abilene, but uh, when we were two, I moved, to, moved to, to Waco. And that was definitely at Christmas. And it's like every Christmas, I'd kind of maybe get a musical thing. You know, oh, okay. my, grand, my grandfather was a musician and he, he passed away when I was like two and a half. So there was always musical instruments around just because of him and and all of that and my mom played piano she plays piano and uh yeah i mean i i don't know how long we had the drum set like i remember getting it but i have a feeling maybe my dad made it disappear i don't know <laughs> i'm thinking about it going like we had it for a while but not long i'm sure i wasn't a very good like three-year-old drummer you know right yeah and then after that there was a blue and green guitar with a blue microphone was. that my you dad, had my dad's holding it for me that was actually yeah. uh that was a birthday i had i mean i'm probably what seven or eight there maybe oh, okay seven maybe i'm six or seven and my aunt and uncle had a pizza place called bluto's pizza it was the best pizza in the world not like it was amazing amazing pizza and they, they only had it for a couple of years uh, but they had like pool tables and video games in there it was outside of Waco. And uh, yeah, that was a birthday party we had. And they bought me a, a microphone. I remember it had little like little like four little glow lights on the base of it that would light you up. You know, they kind of change colors. Nice. A true country rock star. Yeah. And like a something from service merchandise, the green and and blue guitar that you push buttons, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And now you mentioned your grandfather being in a band. Now I have the name of that band. So Arnold Schiller and the Moonlight Serenaders, I believe was the name of the band. You're amazing. Yeah. <laughs> now you mentioned um, he passed away when you were two and a half, but the memories that were passed down to you from him and also your great uncles who played in that band, I imagine they lived a bit longer. So did they pass down that musicality to you? You know, it's wild. They, uh, they, when Arnold passed away, they, I don't, I think they kind of just didn't, they, you know, they all kind of played a little bit, but the, the band kind of stopped, you know? Oh, okay. Uh, but I think the biggest thing they passed down in the family was when I wanted to do music, no one was afraid. Like right. a lot of families are like, well, how are you going to make money? And to, to my family in Texas, it was like, that's amazing. Like, I, um, and also they had jobs and, you know, played music, you know, it was like, well, if I do do this professionally rock and roll and if it works out, that's great. If it doesn't, it's fine. Like God closed the birds in the field and, the, you know, feeds the birds and close the lilies in the field. So it's like, I'm fine. It's all good. You know, have a little faith in yourself and, and, in and, and in the world, but it's, uh, or at least in heaven, I don't really have faith in the world these days, but right. Yeah. I have faith in good hearts, but, um, it's, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I and I remember I, I would sit with my Uncle Al uh, in the in the swing outside of his house and he would we would just kind of sit there quietly, you know, 
teenager me and an uncle Al. And <clears throat> I remember he came out one day and said like, you should have this. This is my favorite one. And he handed me his G harmonica. You oh, know, really? Very cool. But the amazing thing, you got to see this. Yeah. That guitar right there. Yeah. Was my uncle Alvin's guitar. Oh, and wow. It's in almost all of those pictures that I have and his son, James and his daughter, all they all gave, they, they gifted me this guitar and it was in pieces, all the body and the neck. And I had a guy in Nashville put it all back together. So I've got that. Oh, wow. My grandfather's still guitar back here. So I've, I've got a couple things from him. My grandmother was infamous for selling things in garage sales. So I'm oh, sure. Okay. I'm sure the Gibson Hummingbird and all kinds of things were sold probably for a good price, but it would have been cool to have one of those, but it's all good. I've got the original guitar that I know every single brother played. Actually, Alvin took that to World War II. Oh, wow. It's crazy that it's here. So, and it sounds beautiful and I've been recording with it a little bit, but it's, uh, yeah, obviously, yes, there was influence from all the, from my grandfather and all the Moonlight Serenaders and, uh, I, I, I love the memories of them that I hear about them and seeing pictures and thinking of the dance halls that they played and the memories that people made around them playing the soundtrack to the evening, you know. That's amazing. And so within music, with it being sort of around the family growing up, was there a moment where it grabbed a hold of you? Or have you just always had that feeling within you of just that love of music and wanting to do it? Yeah, I... I was never, it was never, I mean, there are photos where it's like, here's a microphone, but it was more like that. I don't know how to set this up. And my mom got the photo, you know, but it's, right. I think back through it's like, I was never really forced to play music, but there was always options around, you know, it wasn't like, you will do this now, Chanel, you know? Right. Yeah. Like chain me to a piano, you know, but, um, you know, it's if I, I got tired of piano, so I stopped playing piano or got tired of violin in school. So I stopped playing violin, you know, and, uh, but really 15 is when I picked up a guitar and started sitting in front of a CD player trying to figure out songs I loved, you know, and uh, and then like, oh, I can play by ear like I can hear it and play it. OK, you know, so it made me feel kind of cool, like, oh, I have this ability that apparently not everybody has, you know. OK. And uh, and then at the same time, I I just thought every singer write their, wrote their own songs. So I started writing songs. You know, I was like, well, I'm, I want to be a musician. I want to be a singer. I'm going to write my own songs. And uh, I'm going to build this, you know. And uh, yeah, so I mean, 15 was definitely the biggest. OK, I'm I like music a lot and I'm going to play music now. And, right. Uh, and even though I'd kind of played music like I can obviously I can write on a piano now because of the lessons I had as a kid. I have no idea what I'm doing, but it sounds good. You know, <laughs> sounds good enough. And so at 15, tell me about the poem that I heard started it all for you. A poem to a girl that you liked. It was. I, I love you. How, where are you? I just need you to remind me of my life. That's yeah. right. That's what I'm here for. You're amazing. No. Yeah. So I wrote a poem. I actually, the artist in me, I actually painted a picture. I painted a picture. It was like a sunset, you know, over hills, green, and I probably watercolored it or something at the time. Just, I mean, I, always, I just love, I love creating and art and all that stuff and uh, um, leaving my thumbprint on things. Apparently, I don't know, but it's, uh, um, but I wrote the poem for her and I didn't, ha I totally left it in the envelope and my brother's 88 fire or firebird, he had this blue firebird. I had it hidden under the passenger seat and I was going to like go out and have the guts and pull it out and go, I, I feel something for you, you know, in my 14 and a half year old voice, 15 year old voice. Right. Uh, I had it in a drawer. I was probably 14 because they were like, well, you know, songs are poems. And I'm like, well, I've got a poem, you know? So I, that was my first song I had. It, I mean, I had the, it's the most beautiful lyric I ever had. Cause I put it through the printer, you know, and printed the lyrics on the, the, picture that i painted okay i mean i totally would have won her over i totally would have eight kids in temple texas right now <laughs> had i done than that but it's uh, uh but it's all good no she's she's she has no clue who she is and she never needs to know but i know she's doing well and uh and uh yeah and i am too yeah exactly and now the confidence within music i saw at one point 
when you were doing some charity work uh, with a school and giving back and helping kids discover music, you were talking about the confidence that music gives someone. Now within you, that confidence when you were 15, 16, did you find music giving you that confidence or was it not until later that you, that helped build the confidence within you? I think uh, obviously any kid feeling like they're special and seen it gives them confidence um I, I think having confidence in front of peers or just a anyone a stranger or your boss or anybody is is, is a good thing to have like uh, confidence and cocky there's a little difference you know right but yeah just being confident in yourself and comfortable comfortable and confident you know and uh i went to a school called meredith dunbar elementary it was a magnet school in Temple, Texas, which it was amazing. So basically just all kids of all different colors and incomes and thoughts and voting parents, you know, all the blue and the red team and the income levels and everything and poverty and rich, all, we were all in the same building and none of us realized what this was other than we're at school, you know? Right. Well, yeah. I, that experience of me being around people that didn't look or talk or completely think exactly like me, I think has helped. I'm grateful to have that, you know? Right. Yeah. Like, don't think in your narrow box, which I think so many people do these days and they're so angry at each other because they don't understand each other because they think everybody sat at the same dinner table growing up. It's like, no, to take the best thoughts together and love people. But, right. um, but, I love that school. That was one thing that taught me. The other thing, get back to our point, was we did musicals, right? So third grade to fifth grade musicals. You're I'm a little little bitty kid. And we did Tom Sawyer and Peter Pan and and The Wizard of Oz. And I never ever would have stepped out on the stage. I'm just not that. I'm a very much introvert person that's learned how to be an extrovert and talk way more than I should on this podcast. But I uh you know, having them encourage me to go out on stage, like, go sing. You know, it's like, well, I can sing. Okay, well, go sing. And I'll do these dances. So I can dance too. Hey, look at me. I'm Tell me I'm pretty, you know? <laughs> right. And, uh, and the confidence of that is what I think kids learn in the arts. It's, it's to be creative, uh, to not every kid is like, I can't, I'm not good at taking tests. Like I can, I'm a, I can work really hard and get an A and I can kind of work hard and get a B, you know, but some of my friends are just really good at memorizing and then they don't know what they learned, but they got an A, you know? Right. Yeah. And so for me to have arts, it was like, well, I'm really good at this and it's easy for me, you know? And, uh, but the confidence of that is, is what I got from that school. And I, 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 I love getting to go share music and for other great reasons, you know, going to schools, hanging out with kids, encouraging them just to have fun, be confident, learn, soak up the good vibes and love everybody in your school, you know, and, and then go into children's hospitals. I have type one diabetes. So to get mm -hmm. to go and hang out with them and go like, Hey, I've been in a hospital. It sucks. You know? And, and also all these nurses and doctors, they love you. They're, they're here to help you, you know, figure out what's wrong. And, um, I actually thought I'd be a pediatric endocrinologist when I was growing up. I thought I'd be a doctor. So it's kind of cool how the heavens have kind of merged me as a musician and as a, in the world of medicine together, which is a lot of fun to do. And, uh, that was a lot of different stories in one, but it all comes <laughs> to take care of each other and, uh, encourage kids to chase whatever dream they have in their heart, because, if it came down to money, the happiest people in the world would have a lot of money. And I don't believe that's true. Absolutely. Yeah. And now within the journey, when you were a teenager, now I saw in, even if it breaks your heart by the Eli Young band, there's a line that downtown is where I used to wander old enough to get there, but too young to get inside. So I would stand out on the sidewalk, listen to the music playing every Friday night. And I saw you mention sixth street in Austin. Now, I was wondering if that was just a random comment or if Sixth Street in, in Austin was actually somewhere where you would hang out as a teenager around the bars down there and listening to the music coming out of them. I totally did. Yeah, that was that was uh, that was where we wanted to play music. So when I was in high school, um, 
I get, I mean, yeah. I mean, heck, as when I could drive, I could drive to Austin. It was an hour away. So we'd go down there and listen to music where we could, uh, try to play music where we could, you know, but it was that thing of I'm, I moved to Nashville when I was 20. So I literally was never old enough to get in a lot of those clubs. Right. Not old enough to get in the club. They won't let you play the club, you know, unless you're like really knew the back door bouncer guy that was like, hey, come on and put this beard on son. You know, but, uh, um, stand taller at cockier all right you're 22 now you know right, but, yeah um but yeah that's a hundred percent truth that line is very much true i love that it said every friday night because at the time i don't think i'd even written maybe i'd written friday night you know it's kind of funny i get to give the crowd a wink every night when i sing that because it's like hey, there's my number one as a singer yeah uh, uh it's uh yeah 100 percent true we used to go down there and just pray we could get a gig and and had a lot of fun i had hair down to the middle of my back what in the world it's ridiculous but we had fun you know that's amazing and now at 16 do you know when i say at the age of 16 what i want to talk about cars <laughs> no i did I, I want to talk about music and sitting in your room recording your own music tell me about this i saw that you recorded a cd back then by yourself in your bedroom I totally did. We had uh, my dad bought Cakewalk, which was a recording program on a PC. You could record four tracks, not at once. You could layer them. Right. I had one track on there called Fish in the Sea that I like to a click, not hearing your, me, me playing by ear. It's like it'd be easy if I could just hear another guitar and play it. But I had to perfectly play it. And then when you push play on all four of them, they all played at once, you know. But um, I basically set up like this, a microphone and a guitar and just played live. So that was the album. There was no auto tin didn't even exist. <laughs> right. No quantizing of making sure every beat is perfect like people do in studios now. Everyone listening is like, what is this? There's trickery. There is a wizard behind the curtain in, the, in every studio in the world. But it's, uh, yeah, it was very real. And uh, I was actually, the, the cover of it, I'm wearing a, like a, a Stetson, like a straw Stetson. I got my Wranglers on a, a white, you know, just a white Hanes shirt. And I'm leaning on my uh, great uncle, uncle's barbed wire fence, you know, with all of his cattle behind him, you know, right. inevitable. I'm a country singer at the 16, even with the Dave Matthews phases and all the music I listened to. It's like, all right. Yeah. I got country in me. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was really cool. And then my dad bought a CD burner, which was, they weren't cheap then, you know, like kind of a new thing. And uh, uh, I sat in front of the computer and printed off a lot of covers and printed off a lot of CDs and stuck a lot of stickers on CDs. And and uh, thank goodness people in the hometown bought enough to make me make it worth sitting in front of a I probably spent more time in front of a printer than I did making music. You know? Right. <laughs> and I saw you talk about at 18 meeting with ralph murphy i think he was uh someone in nashville and and him listening to your cd now was that the music that you were creating in your bedroom that you took to him to show i had recorded three other i had three cds that i recorded back home oh, okay uh, one was that first one i had another one called if i should go that i did around like 18 17 18 I had like 20 songs on it. Dear Lord, I just like everything I wrote I put on there. But, um, and then uh, I, I was in a band called Native Tourist and I probably brought that. Actually, no, at 18, I didn't. I don't think even Native Tourist happened. So yeah, I would have had, if I should go and my first CD of just, and uh, I remember going in and, and Ralph was amazing. He passed away a couple years ago and loved him to death. And uh, he was just a fan of songwriters. He was a, he was a songwriter himself, had hits. And uh, going in and meeting with him and just him encouraging me to uh, just really uh, the he had the Murphy's laws is what he called it. And just all kinds of fun things of like, I have no idea who you're talking about when you say you on the very first word of this verse. It's like that should be the second verse He's like a lot of times we write the second verse first because you have a thought in your head and then you start writing the next line and you needed to start with the first thought, you know, like. Once upon a time, you know, right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, 
just little storytelling things. I remember I uh, picking up from that and I actually flipped verses. It was like, oh, the first verse is the second one and the second one's the first. And it's, it was true. It worked out, you know, and uh, just his ability to encourage writers. And I mean, think of how many 18 and a half year olds Ralph set with that are like, these are not good songs. But he, but he saw that little piece of magic and went, you might have hope, you know. And he didn't put a, a fire. He didn't put the fire out. He encouraged it, you know, and just like go create. And he's like, keep writing, keep writing, and have a reason to come back to Nashville. So I, I ended up moving to Nashville, finishing up school up there, yeah, uh, at Middle Tennessee for music business. But it was just uh, through him encouraging me. And uh, there's another guy in town I, that same trip, uh, and I, I play. He listened to my whole CD, and he goes, he looked at me, and said. Hey, dude, Dave Matthews already exists. And I was like, yeah, I know. And he's like, you're not from South Africa. I'm like, I know. And he's like, find out who you are, you know? Because at the time, if you played Crash Into Me, the girls loved it. Right. So, you know, freaking Ginger Pasley with hair down to the middle of my back, proof I didn't have a girlfriend, you know, it was like, Crash Into Me? I can play that. Look at me, you know? <laughs> that light? All right. You know, but it's... uh you know, that being said, I love Dave Matthews. He's incredibly talented, dear Lord. And, uh, but yeah, I definitely can't sing like him anymore. I sing like me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And so when you went to Middle Tennessee State, is that the moment where songwriting and becoming an artist took hold? Or was it before that, that you knew that's what you wanted your career path to be? Uh, I mean, I think 18, when I was 18 is when I decided, all right, I'm not going to be an endocrinologist. I'm not going to go to school for med school. I'm going to be crazier and go to school for music business. So I uh, did community college, was in my band Native Tourists. So we would play around Texas and, and do all that kind of, it was a jam bandy thing, but looking back through the music, you know, being able to look at younger me and go like, those were actually country lyrics and like, you're actually like, or whatever that is, you know? It wasn't necessarily jam band lyrics, you know? Right. Um, but uh, which jam band lyrics are fun because you can kind of just say chaos. And as long as you paint a picture in the end of a, a universe, it's fabulous, which I love, uh, um, which we need to do more of, I think, sometimes in commercial music. But um, but yeah, uh, moved up to, yeah, moved to Nashville when I was 18. But I really, or when I was 20, wow. I'm telling so many stories. Uh, <laughs> I love it. 18 really decided that and then realized Belmont was really expensive. <laughs> right. Fabulous school, by the way. Really expensive for, for my pocketbook. But we, uh, yeah, and then found Middle Tennessee, which great school, uh, great school, great people, and uh, moved up there when I was 20. And on, I've always been, I've, I literally always thought singers wrote their own songs. So I've I've always... I just wanted to be a singer and then here we go a bunch of famous people recorded my songs and now it's like so you're a songwriter why do you want to be a singer i'm like i had a record deal before any of these songs were cut i don't know what to tell you but on the timeline of my life i was a singer long before i had a cut on a right record. yeah but uh which is just confusing the story i think the story in nashville was told for so long of like he's a songwriter and now he has a record deal it's like no right. i had a record deal long before uh, Jay cut barefoot, you know, but oh, okay. maybe it was right around that. I signed with Capitol and about six or six months into it, but Jake put out barefoot blue jean night. And I was on my radio tour promoting my songs. And they're like, you wrote barefoot blue jean night. How's it feel to be a songwriter? I'm like, I'm, I'm here promoting my own record. <laughs> right. Well, it happened. This is working out fabulously terrible. <laughs> like, this is great. I'm getting paid. I hate this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so how many years, after you graduated, did you spend songwriting before you signed that deal in what was around 2011 that uh, you signed your deal? I, uh, so I graduated in 05, 07, I believe I signed with Calfor Entertainment, the publishing company. And they knew that I wanted to get a record deal. They knew that I wrote. And, uh, you know, it's like in Nashville, I mean, Natalie was actually we worked together she was the song plugger at, at the publishing company and she we were just talking yesterday she was like you worked your butt off she used another word a very meaningful word of just like, and it's true like I was writing two and three songs a day like because that's what I I just head down to write 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 
as many songs as I could. Cause every time you wrote a song, you know, you're swinging a bat to hit a home run, like the baseball player. I mean, it's like, it just swing the bat, swing the bat. You might hit a home run and no one ever hears it. And it might've gone 600 feet and that's all right. You literally wrote a hit, no pun right. baseball. <laughs> and then, so that means when there's someone in the stands, if you've got a bunch of home runs and hits to play, then there you go. But, um, but I just wrote, 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 wrote. We recorded 30 masters uh, that Capital EMI actually bought from us. Um, it, like my management was publishers. And I mean, it was this whole ancestral thing that, that worked out in the end of getting me signed and all that. And I love Billy Lynn and Daniel Hill, Dan Harrell, the guys that all made that happen. Um, but I remember we went in, Mike Dungan, you know, like, here's 30 songs. Good luck picking the single, you know, <laughs> and, right. uh, you know, I, I will encourage kids don't show up with 30 songs. You're going to create chaos. They will not know what to pick. Um, right. That's anybody that's not talent or intelligence. It's just difficult to do. And I remember I wrote barefoot blue G night and I played it, you know, the night after we wrote it or a couple nights uh, and I was starting to play it. And I told them, I was like, I think we should record this barefoot blue G night. Like, everyone loves us and they're like don't do it you're just gonna confuse the label they already got 30 songs you know right. So like, All right okay and so we demoed it and and then natalie my wife she pitched the song for to every everyone in town turned it down twice you know some you know everyone and it was literally her last meeting because billy lynn and her were going to renee bell at sony music and it was renee's last week too which is like all kinds of interesting timing issues wow but uh it was the last meeting and Renee took it and I think maybe for Chesney or something. And then it was like, no, Jake should, should cut this. And there you go. Song of the decade. Yeah, exactly. Wow. And so as you move in to being an, an artist in 2013, you released Friday night before that you had never really wanted in 2011 was your first single. And then 2012, if the fish don't bite and they didn't do fantastically. Oh, and so <laughs> coming into 2013 and Friday night, what was your feeling as an artist? Did you have a feeling of where you were headed? Did you have a feeling about what Friday night was going to do or what was the feeling at that point? Yeah. The feeling was discouraged and heartbroken and uh, frustrated. You know, I, I never really wanted and if the fish don't bite were the two of those songs out of those 30, you know, oh, okay. And, uh, and went and did that. And I, I remember going in with the label, uh, Sydney Mabe, and I literally just broke down. I was just crying going like, what, what do I have to do? Like, this is, I've worked my butt off, been writing songs and writing songs and playing shows and playing shows. And we're finally here. And why, what, what do I need to do? Like, I want to, like, we need hits. I know I have hits. I can sing as well as anyone on the radio. Like, let's do it. And I don't know in that moment if she just thought, fine, I'm playing all the aces and buying the Jokers for Eric this year. Um, Cause I went in the studio with Marshall Altman, recorded Friday night, recorded a, a song about a girl, she don't love you, all those songs. And, uh, and yeah, EMI took it to number one. You know, and and I know some aces are played because it went from like number five to number one in a week. That's that's labels doing their magic. Right. And uh, and changing my life, you know. So thank you, Cindy and, and Mike for doing that for me. And, uh, you know, there are other times I wish more aces were played on my behalf. I think sometimes when you have a great song, labels just assume it will do well. Right. I learned that's not the case. You know, it's like if you have a great song, you still need the aces played on it, you know, yeah. it's still a business to radio. Um, but it's, uh, that being said, I'm not complaining, but I've definitely had some disappointments, but at the time in 2013, uh, there was a amazing moment. Speaking of confidence two two amazing artists came along. I was recording with Marshall Altman. And at the time he was recording Amy Grant. So oh, Amy okay. was in the studio, I was in the suit. We kind of just pop in and out. She'd record something, and then it was my turn to go in. Uh, and uh, she was, we, we'd been friends for a little bit through management. And she was like, hey, Eric, can I record one of your songs? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Which one? She said, deep as it is wide. And I'm like, that's the only one I've ever held on to. Like, it's the only one I, I've, I've learned. Don't give away all my songs or give right. whatever. And uh 
And she was like, no, I want you to sing on it with me. It was like, would that be okay? And I'm like, okay, yeah, okay. So I'm not <laughs> giving it away. I'm getting to sing with Amy Grant. Absolutely. Sign yeah, it'll go on your record first. That's fine with me, you know? And, uh, and she's like, and I also would love to invite one of my friends because there's another, there's a third verse. She's like, can I call her right now? And she like picks up her phone and calls her, you know, and it's like Cheryl. And it's, of course, Cheryl Crow picks up the phone. But at that time in my life, I had had two singles fail. Po could have easily lost the record deal. It's like, okay, whatever. He's having a songwriter hit. Let's just let him do that. He's fine. Right. You know? Which also has played into it, too. It's not like I, I needed a song on the radio to feed myself, you know, and buy yeah. insulin. Well, maybe I needed more to buy insulin. It's so expensive. <laughs> right. Um, but for God to send Amy and Cheryl my way at that time was the biggest confidence I needed. Even with them telling me you're great, I still doubted because I'd gone to radio and all these people loved it and then they loved it and they said they'd play it and then they didn't play it. And you're like, what is, why am I being lied to? What right. about like, I have a pretty good BS meter and I believed all these people, you know, and, and then you realize it's this game business thing that they, they do love your music, but there hasn't been enough aces played, so they can't really businessly do it. It doesn't right. work out for their bottom line, you know? And, uh, and, uh, but basically, yeah, I, I, them, Amy recording that song and in, inviting me at that time definitely helped me sing those songs with more confidence than I would have. Uh, I would have sounded a lot more lost probably at the time had I not had her arm around me and Cheryl just encouraging me going, these are great. You're really good. Radio should be playing you, you know, it was just really, really important time in my life. And within the confidence of being a songwriter and an artist, I saw that the building where you wrote Friday night, barefoot, blue jean night, angel eyes. And you mentioned over like 15, what was it? 15,000 other songs or 1500 other songs or something you mentioned in that post. Cause the building was being torn down within that the number of songs you write and the number of songs that actually go somewhere like i think what are you up to five number ones now as a songwriter and an artist and that that makes you an incredible songwriter but there's how many songs that you've written in the background that have never gone anywhere so how do you balance that as a songwriter as an artist and celebrating the wins but not letting those other 50,000 songs you've written drag you down because they're not going anywhere. It's hard not to get jaded, you know? I mean, it's because you're like, this, my job is to write hit songs, you know? So, I mean, like, oh, my, at least, in my opinion, at least one song a week could be a hit, you know? But in order for that to get there, for the, every star line to do a line is just complete and utter chaos of out of your control. Right. So you just learn, right, right, right. And if there is if there is the call to make to Bobby or someone on the radio, then then do it if it's actually the right call, you know. And um, but there's uh, yeah, I mean, obviously that'd be that'd be hard to do. You you paint five thousand paintings and only one or there's only five on the wall, you know. And you're like, but it's the same hand and the same creative heart that made these. Um, but these are just the ones they hung on the wall. You know, I, I don't, I, I, I honestly don't believe that barefoot blue G night or Friday night are the best songs I've ever written, you know? Right. Um, but they're two of the most famous, you know, but they're just fun songs. That being said, they're uh, people be like, he's full of crap. They are the best songs ever. And it's like, well, anything connected to memories makes it really special. And those songs have had a lot of opportunity to connect to amazing memories, you know? I guess the point I'm saying is uh, if you're a writer out there, any song at any moment at any day could become a hit. Like you have no idea how much is not in your control. And that means anything is possible. And within this journey, when you released Friday night, I think I saw you mention that for a while you were the Friday night singer. Like that's what people yeah. knew you as when you're on stage, when that song hits, it's like, Oh, that's who he is. And so how long did that take for you to sort of break through from that? I mean, I'm, I've, I, I could be busy every Friday night, which is great. I mean, sign me up. Everybody, that's the perfect night to go play a show, you know, right. and they got spending money, you know, have a good time. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, Friday night hit. Then we did song about a girl, which was fun. I actually just watched that video. We, were, we I put a little clip up because Natalie was in the video. Yeah, my wife is in the video. She was uh, my girlfriend at the time. I had co-writers in it. I had a couple flashes of my my mom's mom and my dad's mom in there. Um, and that was cool. And uh, and then she don't love you hit. I think when she don't love you hit. Uh, the fun thing is everybody sings that song like a number one. I think almost everybody thinks it's a number one. Right. And I, I for, for Jen Wayne, my co-writer, I wish we had a plaque for her because it's a hit. You know, I get to see it every night and go like, this is a hit. Everyone sings it. Um, but the honest truth, it only got to 15 on the charts. That means they didn't play it a, a lot, really. Like 15 doesn't get played that much. But the fact that people kept going and listening to it meant, oh, this is a hit. It's like, ah, oh, we should have played more Aces. You could have sold so many more records at Universal. Uh, you know, that means the business person means like that was a wrong play. You should have played more Aces on that song on a business side because we could have really had. I mean, we were nominated for Song of the Year with a number 15 song. Yeah. And all of that. Um, just looking back on that, it's like, ah, oh, I should have done more management dancing and encouraging and whatever I had to do to get that song higher. But, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm grateful for that song cause it allowed me to show a deeper side, like the, even if it breaks your heart side of me as an artist. And so today you've released, even if it breaks your barefoot Friday night, an album of reimagined songs from the hits you've wrote and the hits you've released as an artist and you're doing it independently. So when you talk about all the business side that you've dealt with over the years and the labels and all of that, how does it feel to be an independent artist releasing this music now? It feels great, terrifying, and it's really expensive. <laughs> but other than that, it means I can put out music whenever I want, you know, um, which is insanely freeing. Like, I mean, I'm in the studio right now recording the next batch of music, you know, and and we were just kind of in the studio doing this album. And uh, and it was the, the honest, the business side of it was I was legally able to re-record those songs you know, right. able to record them. And in streaming, the value is owning the masters. It's not as a songwriter. We don't get paid hardly anything from streaming. Like it's like, it's like not, not even fractions of a penny. It's like crazy how, how little people get paid for songs that are streamed. Right. But, but to own the masters, you make a lot of money. So the labels make a lot of money on that. Like, well, I'm my own label. So uh, why not own my own version of Friday night and she don't love you and barefoot blue G night. And even if it breaks your heart, and and also just those other number ones it was like fans have always i play them every night you know i do my version of it of how i wrote it you know and uh, right. and fans have asked for it for years and i had so i have some live versions of it on like live in glasgow and some other live versions but and i thought it was like hey this is a challenge i like making things difficult i don't go buy anything new i have to like recraft it all you know <laughs> and uh spend more time than i should but uh but yeah, I, uh, I, I had fun going in, recorded it with Mitch Fur. He's incredible. He produced uh, Wild Hearts right now. I actually have a song with Keith Urban that's in the top 10. Yeah. I, with Jen Wayne, who she, we wrote, She Don't Love You Together. Brad Tercy is an old Dominion. He's a writer on it. So it's like, what does it take to get a song on the radio? Four artists have to record it. Keith Urban, Brad Tercy from Old Dominion, Jen Wayne from Runaway June, and me, Eric Pasley. So it's ridiculous. Like, what is this? You know, like, why are these four artists, artists on stage? Hopefully to celebrate a number one or song of the year. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, hopefully I'm not jinxing it, but it's already a hit. It's in the top 10. But we're uh, excited about that. But um, I... Uh, I totally lost track. What were we talking about? You asked That's okay. We were talking about your music and just as an independent artist, just being able to do it. Owning it. Yes. Own it. If you can own it and you don't need a label, own it. If you have fans showing up to your shows like crazy and buying all your merch, you don't need a label really, unless you just want to try it. Like I always, we always think it's like, oh, I need to get on the radio. I'm like, there's 10,000 people at your show. You don't need to be on the radio. Like, yeah, it just, the radio lets people know you exist. Come see my show. I'm playing, you know, 
uh, if you're that artist, like I'm that artist, I want to go play shows. It's fun. The interaction, the, 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 the live moments, like, uh, and all of that. But, um, but yeah, I own the masters and uh, we'll see how the, how the spins do. And I, I love these versions and Mitch is incredible. That's what I was saying. Mitch for right, yes. wild hearts and with Keith and he and I were already in the studio working on other projects and uh, he's incredible. He's just incredible. And you're also releasing NFTs. Now explain these to me because I still don't it, quite have a grasp yeah, on what they are. You shouldn't. It's, it's basically a, a, the golden ticket of whatever you want it to be. I, I look at NFTs and I'm just getting educated in it too. But in my mind, what are my NFTs? Uh, I mean, NFTs, people hear about it. It's like there's these gorilla photos that they sell for millions of dollars. Why? I, I can't tell you why other than money thinks it's worth money so right. that's very real and money thinks when money thinks something's worth money money doesn't want to be told it's wrong so i don't think it'll go away for a while if it ever does it's another piece of art it's like tangible art behind you that could be a million dollar painting you know i don't know but but and if it's digitally on your wall or on your building or wherever you want to put this photo that you own now it's art whatever you want to do with it but um in my world, the first NFT that we did, we did a hundred of them. It was a photo my brother and I took at our farm. It's this amazing photo work that he does. It, it, it's like one photo. It's not photoshopped um, of just open exposure camera at night. And he uses all these lights and spins them around, makes this orb, stuck our guitar there, lit it up with a flashlight to where the guitar shows up. She, you know, put a green flashlight on the hay to where the hay lit up, you know, and that's like the photo right and, uh, and then they added kind of like a you know cgi kind of globe spinny thing around it to yeah add animation to the nft but there's a hundred of them so that's kind of my nft community which is kind of a fan club hang and my goal for them is to is like infinite value never ending value this is your 25 dollar ticket that lasts forever like uh, when i'm in europe i'm going to do a show or a hang with them or something or i don't even know yet you know okay but i know that i'm gonna do something and then uh our first meeting i actually gave them a light that was the second nft so i built 10 lights so that nft to me is it is a a visual another orb light going like the theme was light out of darkness and right. here at this house we were hit by the tornado the the a couple of years ago, all the trees came down, a black walnut tree came down. So I built the base of those lights out of that tree. Um, and the infinite value is I gave one away to that 100. So here you go. Here's a, one of the lights. And then we, and then we uh, sold the other nine in like 20 minutes, which was cool. And fans got them and all that. And, you know, infinite value of that. Maybe I become the light guy for a while. I don't know. <laughs> Friday night guy, a Friday light guy. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, it's just to me, it's the golden ticket of there's never ending value to it. That's amazing. And man, there's so much more to talk about. We'll have to have you back on. But one last thing I just wanted to ask you is you had the debut album in 2013. It wasn't until 2020 that we saw your sophomore album. And now we have this new album today. Now within this journey that you've been on since, I mean, 2011 as an artist and before that as a songwriter, where do you feel personally that you are within this career? I don't know. I, I think I'm at a, a point of recreating it because I'm, I'm about to go on a tour in the UK, 25 shows in 35 days with the Shires. And I've been going to Europe quite a bit playing shows and, always playing shows around here and uh you know i i it, depending on the room i'm in i'll be songwriter pasley for you you know like i will write a song for you that fits you and if you're going for radio we'll do that you know and it's and it's we've got a hit right now with keith so it's kind of doing that and i will always be a singer i'm never not going to create and play and sing it's that's not why i'm here i've always i just thought the singer's wrote songs it's like willie nelson taylor swift dolly parton you too uh, imogen heap uh, just go on and cope mark chris martin they're all writers who've had success as a singer and also have had 
songs cut outside. I mean, Neil Diamond wrote UB40's Red Red Wine. Like, what in the world, you know? And, uh, I, you know, I'm going to Europe. I'm, try- I'm just trying to write with Ed and Dua Lipa. It's fine. And Taylor Swift hangs out with him sometime. And they're all gr- better writers than me. So it'd be good to, you know, you got you to gotta write up, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I, I think at this, this phase of life and, and being a dad now too, it's like, I, I don't want to play 250 shows a year. Like, yeah, that's, that's not going to be happiness for me. But I mean, but I'll go play 120 if it's worth it. You know, if it's like not money wise, but going like, this is awesome. Let's go yeah. play with these fans and they want this and we've got hits and let's do it. And come on, Piper and my wife will just like come hang out. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm definitely in a cool little spot of just, I mean, let's get the TV show going. Like, come on, cameras, come see what we're doing. We'll play a song at the end of it, you know? But, yeah, exactly. It's just, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm grateful that I'm in a place where I don't have to work, but I still am gonna, dang it. Right, yeah. It's fun. And uh, I, I just, yeah, I'm not going to sit down and just stop. It's like I'm creating great music and rebuilding houses and raising a daughter and touring all over the world. It's like I'm just going, going while my body still lets me, you know, which I'm still feel good. Thank you once again so much for joining us. And thank you to Eric for stopping by and sharing his story. Be sure to check out his new album, Even If It Breaks, Your Barefoot Friday Night, wherever you stream your music. Please also be sure to check out our website at countrymusicmademe.com. There you can listen to all of our episodes and also sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive content and also stay up to date on all of our exciting upcoming guests. Just head over to countrymusicmademe.com and hit that subscribe button. You can also find us on any streaming platform. So if streaming is your thing, just head over to your favorite, search Country Music Made Me and give us a follow there as well. Thank you once again so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on Country Music Made Me. Music Made Me.